Okay, welcome to the Ocean Use Text Review Review. I'm just going to go over this really quick. Um, with Ocean Use, it's all about the use of our oceans. Hopefully you got a sense for how stressed our oceans are. Um, but know that it's 71% of the, of the Earth's surface is oceans. We've only explored about 5% of that. So there's a lot of background knowledge that the oceans are largely unexplored. Right there is the number. And what that means is we, what we have is a research frontier. All right? It's the final frontier on Earth. We've basically been everywhere on land. We know most of what is on the land or under the land. The oceans are very different. So there's a lot of jobs in the future, a lot of exploration to be done. Um, they literally call it the, the final frontier on Earth. We know more about space and our local region of the solar system than we do about our o oceans. Going down here in 2003, a study showed that uh, the coastal, coastal waters are in trouble. So what can we do? We need laws. Um, pass a National Ocean Policy Act, a National Policy Act, that would then regulate ocean use, uh, pollution, just like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, we need a National Policy Act uh, for the oceans. And in doing so, we can double the federal budget for ocean research. Um, doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon, however, you know, even on a state level, money needs to be there for ocean research. We can base fishery management on uh, preserving ecosystems and habitats rather than just putting quotas on how many fish you catch. Anytime you want to do good for a particular species, preserve their ecosystem or their habitat and the species populations will respond. So it's all about preservation of habitat if you're worried about a particular species. And then you could set up a network of marine reserves. And that, in my mind, is a no-brainer. Um, if you concentrate those reserves in places where there's a breeding or nursery grounds, um, you're going to help preserve populations of fish that way. There's four... Uh, legal solutions for the protection of coastal waters. Moving down here, biodiversity is in, is higher near the coast. So I need you to understand that that's where most of the life within oceans are on the coast because that's where the plants are, that's where the the base of the food chain is. All right? Along with the coasts, if you do go out a little bit into the ocean, it's on the bottom of the ocean floor. We call that the benthic region. It's on the bottom of the ocean floor where there's more biodiversity rather than in midwater. We call that the pelagic region. All right, there's not too much food. There's not too much habitat in midwater. It's all on the bottom of the ocean or on the coasts. Okay, and I'm going to flip back and forth here real quick. You could take this note. You need to know a little bit about the terminology of the ocean here. And if you look at this image, this is from your textbook, Figure 7-6. Uh, it, it basically shows you some of those regions. So what we have here is we have the ocean floor going from left to right. Um, at the top of the, of the picture here is the, is the ocean surface. So I'll color that in real quick. All right, and if you notice here, this is where most of the ocean species are, over here on the coastlines. So just off the coast is where your coral reefs are, most of your primary producers. Um, it's, it's heavily lit, so that's where all the life is, the base of the food chain all the way up through the tertiary consumers. Now, these consumers that do live out in these pelagic regions, they have to come over here for food. So this is where most of the species are along coastal areas. However, that's where most of the habitat destruction occurs, human development, uh, pollution entering from rivers uh, it's the most threatened area of the ocean but it's also the most biodiverse so if you can write down some of these uh, ter this terminology here um, this is basically the coastal region or they call it the estuary zone or the coastal zone okay the coastal zone that's where most of the biodiversity is as you go out into the ocean um, the area of which light penetrates is called the euphotic zone so if you go down in the ocean, deeper depths, at some point you're going to lose the light. Um, the euphotic zone is where the light penetrates and it produces photosynthesis. All right, so there are zooplankton and phytoplankton and the base of the food chain exists out here in this pelagic zone, the open water. All right, but not as much as the coastal zone, just keep that uh, separated in your mind. So out in the pelagic zone, uh, that area at which plants can grow, light penetrates, we call that the euphotic zone. Go a little deeper, uh, light starts to become a little bit uh, more scarce, we're in the batharal zone. All right? And if you notice here, we dropped off the continental shelf, so we're in deeper waters. Um, there are organisms that live in this region, Okay, just less 
than up in the euphotic zone and the coastal zone. But that middle there, the batheral zone, is where light starts to diminish and it starts to get a little dark. And the deeper you get, you end up entering the abyssal zone. All right, this is where light does not penetrate. This is uh, the deep ocean floor. Interesting organisms that live out here. It does have life. I don't think that it's devoid of life. There are plants and animals that live out here, um, but do you want to know that as the abyssal zone? So there you go. That's a little bit of the structure of the ocean going from the coastal zones out into the pelagic zone, the open water, and then as you go from top to bottom, you go from the euphotic zone where light penetrates to the batheral zone, it's a little darker, and then the abyssal zone where it's the darkest in the ocean floor. All right, so let's continue along here in this discussion, uh, this very quick and brief discussion. Globally, we get about 6% of our protein from the oceans, so that should stand out to you as being an important resource, and that's only going to grow in my mind, but it's also important for another reason, because we get pharmaceuticals and antibiotic and anti-cancer chemicals are coming out of some of this, some of these organisms, uh, algae, sponges, and moths. Remember, the oceans are the most poorly understood ecosystem in the world. The cure for cancer could lie in our oceans, yet we continue to destroy them and just keep them out of sight, out of mind. So <clears throat> I wanted to bring up the point that pharmaceuticals and antibiotics and even anti-cancer medicines are out there. And you know we need to preserve and protect not only for biodiversity, but for, for human use medicines and pharmaceuticals. At the bottom here it talks about the oceans providing that ecological service of being a climate moderator. And if you remember uh, the oceans, and if you can come over here, absorb CO2. So they become our, a carbon sink, a very important carbon sink. And as more and more carbon gets emitted into the atmosphere, the ocean takes it, and there's that carbon cycle at play. So the oceans moderate our climate in that they absorb carbon dioxide instead of it being acting as a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. A lot of ecological services here. The oceans do great with nutrient cycling, uh, waste management, and dilution. And this is a big one. Oceans and coastal areas help reduce storm impact, All right, particularly those uh, mangrove forests that grow along the coasts and coastal wetlands. So there's some important ecological services and economic services. Um, we talked a lot about the food, um, the pharmaceuticals, uh, recreation, harbor, and transportation routes, offshore oil and natural gas, and it creates jobs. So the ocean is uh, not only provides ecological services, but economic services as well. All right, continuing through. How are humans destroying aquatic biodiversity through habitat loss? So what are we doing that's creating um, habitat loss? We literally develop the coastal wetlands, all right? So development. People love to live near the coast. And wherever there's development, there's pollution. Okay, people love to live near the coast. Ocean warming, soil erosion from rivers entering the ocean, and algae growth from fertilizer runoff are all big ways that coral reefs and aquatic biodiversity along the coastlines are being threatened. All right, not to mention trawling activities. So there's a lot of stuff going on there um, in regards to degradation of coastal ecosystems. All right, I wanted you to realize that there's 200 commercially valuable marine fish species, almost half of which are in the United States, but that's how many fish are actually fished for food. Um, overfishing is the greatest threat to populations of fish, and it's only by government subsidies that the fishing industry actually makes a business of this. <clears throat> All right, They get tax breaks and government refunds and things like that, and they use that to purchase things like sonar, GPS, aircraft to find fish. If they didn't come up with a, a, an economically viable catch, it wouldn't be worth it for the businesses. So they rely on government subsidies and they rely on technology, pretty sophisticated technology, to bring in high yields of fish. Okay, so because of those things, modern industrial fishing can cause 80% depletion of a target fish species in a very short time. You could deplete a fish species in as little as 10 years. So hopefully that gives you a little sense of how important it is to put those laws and regulations in place. A couple of invasive species you should be aware of. Purple loosestrife we even have over at the Nature Center. Asian swamp eel came in as an invasive species and started invading coastal areas and inland wetlands as well. Um, just two things to bring up. 
What's the problem with ships filling their ballast? Well, this is how ships float. They basically allow water into their ship at the bottom of the ballast, and that makes the you know that'll cause the boat to sink a little bit but it allows buoyancy at the same time now because they filled their water in the chesapeake bay then it travels across the ocean and it <clears throat> it pulls in the harbor in let's say thailand so now it has to let that water out in it some organisms so now you have water and organisms from chesapeake bay entering into a harbor in thailand or vice versa and that's how very easily invasive species can spread all right, so there's a couple of techniques that you could use. You can create screens um, to put over the pumps, or you can try and filter out those aquatic or organisms. Uh, just know that it's very easy for invasive species or just species to be transported all over the world very quickly. Should commercial whaling be resumed? Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, most of the students who answer this question say only if quotas can be adequately monitored and regulated. If quotas can be monitor, monitored and enforced, and we understand things like maximum sustainable yield, I feel like commercial whaling uh, could could be sustainable. All right, blue whale populations. What makes it difficult for blue whale populations to recover? They have a very low reproductive rate. You want to make sure you know what that means. They have a very low reproductive rate, and what that means is they might have one baby every two to five years. If you kill two or three whales, you've killed uh, two or three generations of whales. So very quickly, numbers can deplete because of that low reproductive rate, which is in direct opposition to, let's say, a housefly that lays thousands of eggs, or mice that every two or three weeks they have, you know, seven or eight babies. So the reproductive rate is very low, and that that's the same with whales. It's the same with polar bears, elephants, giraffes, those types of organisms have low reproductive rate and they're the ones that tend to go extinct uh, quicker than others. What is an MPA? A marine protected area. This should sound like a no-brainer to, to you. Protect it from all human activity. Let's make sure it's those places where there's spawning or breeding going on. As of right now, it's a very small part of the total ocean, uh, but this is a solution. Marine protected areas. And to finish up, how do coastal communities and government work together? They use this co-management approach where the government sets regulations, let's say quotas, and a coastal area would then go out and enforce them. Um, it could provide jobs. It could uh, lead to the sustainability of local fisheries. In my mind, this is a no-brainer. Um, co-management works. It's proven. Um, and then throw in the concept of individual transferable quotas where... Um, the government sets quota regulations, but fisheries or companies can buy and then sell or lease those quotas. Let's say there's five fishermen and everybody's allowed to get 20,000 each. All right, and everybody does that, except for this guy. He can then sell his quotas that he didn't use to a third fisherman and make some of his money back and we still stayed within the quota. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, individual transferable quotas work. Um, they just need to be enforced. Finish up here, I gave you managing fisheries a solution. This is a great note. When you go to study in the spring, all right, it talks about all the stuff that we talked about, regulations, uh, bycatch problems, economic approaches, f fish farming, protected areas, consumer information, non-native invasions. This is a great study tool for later in regards to this unit and this concept, these concepts. And then the same thing with coral reefs here. You can look at these and understand how coral reefs as natural capital are being threatened. Okay, hopefully this helps. Have a great day.